Okay, so welcome everybody. And it's been a while since we had our last meeting, um, but it's great we're all here and perfect timing since everyone's home and isolating. So we've got Georgina here with us today. Teresa can just introduce her um, and then we can get started and we can do question and answers at the end. So just hold your questions or type them in the chat if you think you'll forget them and then we can come to them at the end. So yeah, Teresa. Um, so, from what I know of Georgina, um, I, I actually work at an organization called Donor C that um, that partners with her organization Pomo Jaleo, and I think she's just doing really incredible work transforming orphan and vulnerable childcare um, in the Tonga region right now. And um, you know, this type of family preservation and reunification work um, is so important. So I thought that you know, given all of the all of the challenges that she's currently facing as you know, COVID is happening, as borders are closing, it would be great to kind of for her to share her experience of what she's been doing up until now and um, uh, yeah, and what the climate is looking like um, in, in its current state. So I, I think Georgina probably is better at explaining her, her mission um, than I am, but yeah, we've loved working with her and um, I think she's really making, making an impact on the lives of so many families and children. Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> it's really kind of you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my name is Georgina. I'm actually originally from the UK, um, but I've been living in Tanga region for the last six and a half years, um, working for an organisation called Pomodileo that works specifically in the Tanga region. And like the core mission of Pomodileo is really working to transform care for orphaned and vulnerable children. And so that kind of the way that sort of translates to the organization is specifically looking to reduce, heal and prevent trauma for orphaned and vulnerable children, specifically under the age of five. Um, and the organization started out really with a big question. What is happening to orphaned and vulnerable children? And the first thing that we, how we actually founded the organization was we started working with the Tanzanian government asking, do you actually know to do them? And the, the short answer was no, nobody actually knew. There was no central data that was collecting that information. And so we started actually as a very small um, effort of a few people started out to collect that data in conjunction with Tanga District Social Welfare Department. And that kind of set off something much bigger than we ever anticipated because what we found out was in some ways shocking, but also in line with what globally is understood. And what we found out was most children who lived in orphanages had a family. Um, most of them had a living known family. Very few children were there because of abuse. Very, very few children. And most of the reasons that children were coming into orphanage care were things like one parent had died, poverty, um, health crisis. And so when we started looking at that, that was kind of the basis of all the work that Pomodileo has done since. We started to say, okay, well, if we know that children need to live in a family, they thrive in a family, that it has many sort of social, emotional, psychological health benefits, um, and that trauma can have a lifelong impact on a child, what could we be doing to strengthen the response to children who, who, are, who are facing very real crisis? And so Pomodileo then started to work with both the government and also providing our own services. And we started with the biggest one, which was, okay, babies. Why are babies falling out of their family? And the biggest thing that we found was mum died. Mum would die and then the child would be sort of either sent away or what we ended up finding out was suffer quite severe consequences of malnutrition. And so we started a project to provide formula milk for babies whose parent, whose mother had passed away and train and support the female caregiver, any female caregiver that would stand up and step in to parent that child. From that, we then started to meet weekly with these parents, to new parents, to weigh babies um, and to make sure they were growing. And the response was amazing. Children were thriving, families were doing amazing, and children were just doing really well in family-based care. And the project started to grow from there. We started then supporting families to start businesses so they could sustainably care for the children in the future. From that, we then also started a free daycare service and business training program for kinship carers. So basically any grandma or aunt that took in children 
and giving them business skills and also a free place for their children to come during the day so that they can um, you know, improve their economic earning capacity. Um, and so those were really the two core services that we started to provide children at the beginning. And what we started to find was actually we could keep children in a family um, most of the time instead of them having to ever be separated and the consequence of that separation is just documented to be so traumatic that actually in 2019 the UN General Assembly met and uh, that every country ratified and signed that they would all countries would now move away from orphanage and institutional forms of care into family-based care because it was just so overwhelmingly documented how traumatizing and negatively that impacted the, the, the brain development of especially infants but also the long-term social consequences of being raised in an institution and so we then looked at well you know how do we keep this going some children really do need a new family especially in cases of abuse and so we started training and recruiting foster parents and we've now got 15 foster families in the tanga di district and we're about to roll out pre-covid um, to the Tanga region um, to start having foster families who are there as kind of a safety net, social safety net for children who really can't stay in a family of origin, maybe because of abuse or abandonment, um, that that's just not an option. And again, it was one of those things that socially everyone was like, that's not going to happen. That's not really possible. Tanzanians won't foster. Tanzanians don't do that. And actually, we found the absolute opposite response that through a lot of training and awareness raising that we had an extremely overwhelming response just we were only actually seeking eight foster families to start with we had 29 families come forward and selected 15 from from the, from that group of families and so what we've started to see is that actually it really is possible to raise children in families and that it it, it works um, so we now work with the tanzanian social welfare department to reunify children to get children home who are currently in orphanages back into families. We also run a lot of prevention programs now. So we work on um, educating families and children on sexual abuse and sexual violence and what it is. Um, and we provide services to children who have been sexually abused. And then we do a lot of family strengthening work, predominantly focusing on children under the age of five. And so that's sort of who we are and what we do in a nutshell. <laughs> I've tried to be as succinct as possible. <laughs> Not my forte. <laughs> can you um can you share some of uh some of what's happening uh in in relation to coronavirus and yeah. how you guys have been responding and I don't yeah. know any hardships that you've been sure. facing? Sure. So I mean, schools cl closed, and obviously we run a big free daycare program, and part of that program is a feeding program because majority of the children that we got referred to us. We sort of cycle around every January, we have new children start. Um, this year, we had a very high number of children start with us who are HIV positive and were considered malnourished or undernourished. And so when schools closed down, we were only at the very beginning of that cycle working with the family. And so a lot of the children that we were working with, we were just at that sort of very beginning stage of let's get the kilos up of a child, let's start working on some very sort of basic immediate work with, with these children. And so when schools closed down, that basically meant that the feeding program also was changed drastically. And so we had to adapt our services to start providing food parcels to send home to the children. And we've turned ourselves into basically a Meals on Wheels service, is the best way to describe it. And driving around, we've got a big yellow school bus that somebody helped us buy last year. And we stock it up with food, a social worker, a teacher and a driver, and drive around to all the different communities that we work with, uh, providing food. Um, a social worker does a, a distance checkup and check in on children. So from afar, make sure that any kids that we're worried about in any way, um, we do put eyes on children that maybe are a bit more of at risk of, you know, losing weight. We're also able to then check in on children who, who are HIV positive and check their clinic cards and their medical cards. Are you going to clinic? Are you getting medication you need? Um, majority, I think about a third, just over a third this year of the caregivers we work with are grandparents. So we've also got a lot of work to do with actually supporting grandmas and, um, and about another, I think, gosh, I think it's about another third of the caregivers themselves are HIV positive. So what we really realized is during, during this time, 
Whereas we previously used to provide food just for the children that were enrolled in the program, we've had to really expand that food provision just as an urgent need to, to, to kind of keep families okay. You know, families lost as well work. You know, many of the families were doing very small business skills. And so we had people who were selling cakes at schools. You know, that income is just gone overnight. Um, people who were doing casual labor work, gone. There was people that would do casual labors, breaking stones at a factory, you know, in one of the areas, they all got told, you know, we don't need you anymore. So very quickly, people who kind of had a two day buffer, maybe for food, were really going, oh, I don't know, don't know what I'm going to do now. Um, so one of the biggest things we have done is turn our services into a, just a meal response, really food, um, transport. The second big thing that we kind of got hit with is we provide a, the only free milk service in Tanga. So uh, we have children that travel from Pangani, Segera, um, up into the Usambara Mountains. And two things happened when, when, when people traveled less, you know, those small buses aren't coming out of the villages because they're going to wait till they're full. People aren't traveling as much. And so suddenly families just couldn't travel. You know, and we have the furthest family travels almost two days to come every week to pick milk up. Um, and she just couldn't make it anymore. So we had to then again really reconsider how we were doing that project. And so we turned into a mobile milk service as well, driving out as far as past Sudani we have to go. Um, for some families who, who are down there, we try and go every other week to see the families now um, and to weigh the babies. And one of our biggest fears was that um, getting enough milk. You know, Tanga, because we're the biggest purchasers of milk in Tanga, it doesn't just come, <laughs> you know, we have to really order, pre-order that milk. And there's just been a lot of, um, you know, most of the milk is imported from South Africa. And there's a lot of worries about getting enough quantity of milk. So we've been pushing to do a big fundraiser so that we can afford to bulk buy milk in much larger quantities than we used to. We also used to fund milk through like sponsored running events and they've all just gone. You know, overnight, everyone that was doing a sponsored run has just had to cancel, you know, those sorts of things. Some people are still trying to do things, but it's really impacted our milk provision budget. And so that's been one of our biggest stresses is trying to secure enough milk that's going to see us through, you know, who knows how long. So those have been some of the two biggest challenges that we've been facing because cases are still being referred. That's the other really difficult thing. It's like mums are still dying in childbirth. Babies are still needing to be referred for services. So it's like you can't stop, but you've got to kind of really reinvent the wheel. And it's a really hard thing to plan for. Who knows how long this goes on for? Who knows how many babies will be, you know, always providing for? So getting enough quantities of milk has been one of our biggest challenges um, to date. So how is, how is your funding happening? And uh, are, are you like a, a registered NGO and got anything yeah. to oversee? So the, yeah. yeah, so the charity is registered here in Tanzania. It's a Tanzanian registered charity. A lot of the funding does come from a UK charity as well, um, of which I'm on the board of in the UK. Um, we have support from here in Tanzania locally. We have a few local businesses that specifically Specifically on the milk project have started to kind of step in and help some companies are doing it as part of their CSR. We've applied for grants, so a lot of our work has been grant funded in the past. Um, we do a lot of corporate partnerships so with businesses, especially the UK, the US and Cyprus. We've got a couple of partnerships with businesses. Um, and yeah, a lot of, you know, Pomodulo, I think what makes it quite you know, unique is we've got a really diverse donor base. And the idea behind Pomodulo when it was started was that it, we, wanted to, we wanted to be an intentional small charity because we wanted to remain accountable to the people that we were serving. And so we wanted to keep it so that it was actually an act. We, the kind of motto behind Pomodulo is small acts of change, you know, is what it takes. And this concept of it, that it takes a village to raise children and actually that child raising should be more of a local and even global community effort. And so that really underpins kind of how we go about doing all of our work, including our fundraising. So we have donors that give two pounds a month, you know, 6,000 shillings a month from their pocket money, all the way up to corporates who are doing, you know, a thousand dollars maybe, you know, and everything kind of in between on sort of monthly donors who kind of keep really the core of it ticket. But it's been tough because COVID obviously means people are losing their jobs, which means corporate sponsors can no longer maintain the kind of level of support that they had done in the past. So it's a bit of a uncertain time, I guess. 
So um, anyone, if you have any questions, just feel free to unmute and ask your questions. So I have a general question for you. Do you think like orphans in Tanzania are overlooked in terms of funding and donating? Like I know a lot of people donate to like mothers who die in childbirth or like we do as a club feminine hygiene. But I don't know, I think orphanages and orphans, I feel have been overlooked. Do you feel the same way in terms of like yeah, so I think, I think, so a lot of, it's one of my passions is talking about kind of how the, the orphan has been, has been um, overlooked. And I think one of the things that's happened is orphanages sound great. But if we actually think about it, if I, I'm a mother of children, if I died tomorrow, it's not what I would be wanting for my own child. And so actually what we've done is made these places called orphanages, or we think we can mass raise children. And what all the evidence, the science comes out of saying is, that doesn't work. It, that is not a, 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 a way of raising children that is without consequence. That has massive, massive consequences. So what I think has happened is orphan and orphanages have almost become synonymous with one another. And actually, orphanages globally, 80% of children in orphanages in the, around the world have a living mother or father or both. So actually who orphanages are housing are not orphans. They are children who are mostly experiencing crisis. And so what tends to happen is orphans actually reside in the community and targeted support for those children and understanding their unique situation that they face is very much overlooked in a lot of programs planning you know we as a society we tend to have this concept of a child has a mum and a dad and his parents who are looking out for their best interest and that's not always the case and so the need to kind of create support structures around orphaned children who reside in our communities is really important and I think it's very um, one of the areas that I always look at is to say you know foster foster care that should be the community response to the orphan issue is we should be plowing resources behind families for children who don't have one instead of housing children in orphanages which are institutions that cannot replicate the the, the sort of social and function that a, that a family a mother a carer does and so to me i actually think one of the signs of if we are really seeing orphans who they are what they need is that we start to invest in solutions that actually consider them which are things like foster care families, support for the people that step in and step up to love children. Um, and that's one thing that I've always found really amazing and it's something that I want to share is a lot of cynicism often. And um, through the MILK project that we've run, I see incredible acts of, you know, motherhood come through from neighbours, aunts, grandmas, great, great grannies who step up and step into that role of mother. And the great thing through our project is we get to monitor that family. Our social workers see them every single week and get to really let that relationship grow. And when we become a year, um, when you see that family graduate off, it is like that child has been created into a family. A, a son or a daughter came out of that. And that should be, you know, at least the goalpost for care for vulnerable children is to be able to create family um, and not to permanently segregate or separate children. Because, you know, we all have those same basic needs is a family to care for us on top of all the other things that we need. Um, and the other thing that's worth noting as well is often vulnerable children are often children are, are at a much higher risk of abuse. And particularly in orphanages, interestingly enough, a child's risk of abuse in an orphanage is significantly higher than in a foster family, biological family. And that's data done by the UN um, that's over many, many countries, Tanzania was one of them that they surveyed, um, that looks at abuse and orphan children are at much, much higher risk of being abused. And so again, targeting projects that, that, that keep that in mind and, and are, are conscious of that, uh, of that need is really important. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you have any questions for Georgina? Right. Uh, Georgina, sorry. Uh, there is also a, a Rotary is running a milk uh, project in Moshi. Uh, I will try and connect you to them as well and just see if there is anything that, that you could do. In Moshi? Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that because we have a little group actually of people in Tanzania who run similar projects with milk 
okay. to try and support one another and who are trying to do more around keeping babies in families. And I didn't know of anyone in Moshi, so I'd be interested to hear. Yeah, so I'll, I'll send you the contact for that. Uh, yeah, that would be awesome. I have a question on, um, sure. like the, I guess, social welfare of the caregivers. How do you, what do you train them in? What mm -hmm. do they end up doing? How do they earn their money to support now this, I guess, extra child that they've had to now take under their wings? Yeah. So what we tend to do is our model works pretty much for the first six months, just focusing on the child. Um, and just understanding the relationship between child and caregiver and working on that with counsellors if that's necessary. So after about six months, a family can graduate into what we call our mamapreneur project. Uh, and we've done different things um, to date. And currently what we found to be quite a successful project has been uh, we've done some training around soap making and um, getting families trained by a soap maker and then they can go and sell that in the village and that's been quite a nice one here in Tanga that people have um, really benefited from doing. We've had one auntie been hugely successful with her soap making little empire. We've sent a few people to VETA if that's appropriate. Um, so VETA vocational training schools uh, to learn tailoring. We graduated a group of 10 tailors uh, last year. That tends to be a favourite although I'm a little bit more reluctant to keep helping more tailors because I'm not sure that it, <laughs> there's the demand for it, although it seems to be a popular choice. We, this year, again, pre-COVID, we've been looking at creating and um, purchasing a machine to grind our own nutritional flour and to train families on making um, nutrition flour so that they can again go and sell that. We tend to find that uh, we've done things with um, providing goats and chickens. That's worked. A little bit in the past uh, so we kind of tend to evaluate whatever group we've got kind of coming in and then sort of tailor something to who's in the group depends on how literate that 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 particular group of people are if they're more rural or urban based because a lot of our families are from Tanga town and then we've got a lot as well from more rural areas around Tanga so we kind of have to assess what works for each each family group and a lot of the time, just one other thing to add is sometimes for some families, just the daycare can be a huge change for them because they can then go out and make a living in the shamba or doing what they needed to do and not have to worry about their child. So actually, a lot of the time for some families, not all, but some families, it's enough that the bus comes, picks up their child in the morning, takes them to a daycare, they're happy, fed, and then drops them back at home in the afternoon. And then that family can, that, that, that grandma or aunt can then go and earn a living especially you know when they're taking in younger children under the age of five who aren't school aged yet that tends to sometimes be enough for a family that they can then say oh, actually I, I can do it on my own after that uh, how do you differentiate between street children and orphans because you said orphans are not really um, people I mean children without parents the same thing is true for the street children um, oh. they have left their houses because of a struggle or abuse or anything? How do you differentiate if they do come into your center? Sure. So Tang, Tanga doesn't have as big of a street connected child problem as say Dar es Salaam does. Um, so Tanga does, an orphan is defined as a child who's lost one or both parents. So one parent would be a single orphan, two parents would be a double orphan. To most people in our minds, we think orphan, no parent. Um, so when you're talking about, that's why the term, kind of the, the, the catch term is orphaned and vulnerable child to connect to children who have also maybe been neglected or abused or do not have a okay. family able to meet their needs. So that's why the kind of catch all term is orphaned and vulnerable child to, to, to connect to all of that. The reason I bring up that not all children in orphanages are orphans is because it changes the way we think about it. If the children in there have parents, why aren't we helping the parents? And children who come into orphanages, by and large, in Tanzania, we don't have much data, but the data that we do have from Tanga, by and large, the biggest reason behind a child coming into the orphanage is that their parents were poor. That is it. And then some charitable institution went and offered help. And the help that was offered was, I'll take your child. And actually under Tanzanian law, that's not allowed to happen. It's actually not 
it's legal under Tanzanian law. But that has been, by and large, how the system has operated up until date, is that when families seek help, often the only help offered is, I'll take your child, which, you know, in many cases, people think and believe it's a great thing to do. But what we do know is you can't take away children and raise them in institutions without that having a long term consequence on the psychological well-being and development of that child. So it really needs to be looking at if we can consider that most of the children in an orphanage have parent or a family then it kind of changes the way we start to think of well, more of our work should be focused then on supporting that child back into their family versus so for example with the milk if if we know that children have families behind them and maybe the, the reason they're there is their family are poor and their mum has died so they can't afford the 19,000 shillings twice a week to feed the baby then if we took away that barrier you know, majority of the babies in baby homes wouldn't need to be there anymore if, if we just gave the family, you know, the services that they need versus taking that baby outside of the family. And especially with babies, for every three months that a baby is in an orphanage, they lose one developmental month um, through research has shown. So it's really having a long-term consequence on their development in those, particularly those first two years. And children can develop things like attachment disorders. And it might sound like a small little thing, but you know, our basic attachment at those first two years of life set us up for everything. To love, to trust, to risk, to, to do. I mean, we all, we all are who we are because of that attachment that we created with caregivers in our lives. You know, when we cried, someone came. When they gazed into our eyes lovingly, we responded. And that actually wired our brains. And when we, de when we deny children that, the consequence is huge. And so and just what the research just shows is orphanages cannot replicate families. And so we, we, you know, we really need to be more aware of providing developmentally appropriate solutions to orphaned or orphaned and vulnerable babies. So the foster families, do you fund them as well? Yeah, so um, foster care in Europe, a lot of the time is professionalized foster care so you get paid foster parents and a lot of the research coming out of Africa said that that doesn't really work and so we consulted with some different foster care programs from Rwanda, Uganda, Malawi and what they found was that actually when you professionalize foster caring in the sense that people got paid a salary it didn't work so well and so we designed the project with the government to ensure that families were supported but were not paid to foster and families are very aware of that when they register and so what we currently do is we have what we call the foster closet and in a foster care closet that we run out of Pomodileo, every child that goes into foster care is given a backpack and we try and fundraise for those and people do in-kind donations we have a couple of people from dar that have helped us in the past collect items to pack into those bags and what that means what, what we put in there is to take away that financial shock so you know clothes bottles bed sheets a mosquito net um cutlery you know anything little books and toys so that child goes into that family and the family are not like burdened with a huge financial cost the government also has agreed in tanga interestingly enough foster care is run on a district a regional level not at a national level so every region can design its own program within the like legal framework but in tanga Anger, they have agreed to waive all medical and education education associated costs to the government to any child in foster care and so what that means is the family is basically left to be able to provide food for that child um, and most families do sign up in full awareness that food is part of that now for example right now during COVID-19 we have included foster families now with getting a small food parcel because we know that they're economic hardship has increased and therefore we do not want them to not care for their foster child because of that so we have you know and there is provision within the law for that but fundamentally what's really almost more beautiful and amazing is there are 15 Tanzanian families here in Tanga that have stepped up and taken these children really into their lives and it is beautiful the relationship that we're seeing foster mothers develop with their foster children and I'll just give you an example we've had a little girl who was sexually abused by her stepfather and she's been in foster care and it's because of her foster mum that she has had the courage to speak up and speak out about what happened to her her foster mum and you know in a in a context where you know Tanga has the highest rates of abuse in Tanzania towards girls in 2019 it came out um, we also have a really appalling uh, rate of conviction 
because children often change their testimony. And through foster care and foster parents being trained, they're trained in dealing with the this foster mum's able to thrive. The night that she got took on this placement, she started a chicken in celebration. I mean, she was cooking like the big meal and a fancy meal to welcome this little girl into her home. And so it's a really actually an amazing thing when communities do step in as foster parents and take on the children as their own. So there is some sort of financial cost to the family, but there is also some support in place. And the social worker also visits any family that has a, a placement both the government social worker and Pomodulo social workers visit, just to check in, like if a family's really struggling, okay, is there something we can do? We'll include foster families in future business trainings as well, if there's anyone that we see as necessary, maybe that, hey, you know, would you like to get involved in this training so you could improve your livelihoods access? So um, another question, why do you think yeah. a program like yours is not being implemented, say somewhere like, Dar es Salaam, or is it already being implemented here as opposed to an orphanage, like a typical orphanage? You know, yeah, so I, I run a Facebook group, which is a network of some, um, practitioners in this field within Tanzania. And there is a big growing movement. You know, the, the UN published guidelines in 2018, the UN um, signatories in 2019. Uh, there's been a lot of big research papers coming out that sort of said, hold your horses, orphanages, uh, what's going on here? We're actually damaging children. Let's rethink this. So in some ways, it's like the general public and practitioners need to catch up kind of with what's going on. And it is new and emerging in some ways, you know, the, the haven't quite caught up to what the science is sanctioned. In a lot of wing, and it is growing. At Beat, so Promodulo has provided and um, created some tools to help orphanages that are looking like, okay, we want to change, but we don't know how. Another big thing is donors. Donors like orphanages. I mean, it is, it is one of those things. If, if I go to you and say, I'm running a family reunification project, a lot of orphanages have found that donors run to the hills. And so I actually believe that a big part of it is donor awareness, because if people don't know what is the, you know, evidence-based best practice to intervene for orphan children. We keep funding things that aren't in children's best interest as much. So I think donor, donor awareness is a big, big contributing factor. And in some ways it's difficult leap to make because, you know, dealing with just a child and you can say child rearing, I mean, it's difficult. I don't know how many parents are here, but child rearing is not easy, but you're not dealing with complicated societal issues. So most children end up in orphanages because of a, a foundational reason. They're there because of health concerns. They're there because somebody died. They're there because they need milk. They're there because of poverty, right? They're there because of their disability. What those require is more complex and more complicated often um, types of interventions. And it can be a scary leap to make. So I think a lot of the time it's also just fear and skill. Um, and without, you know, I, I really do not put any sort of negativity towards people running orphanages. I believe that it, it, people do what they believe to be right at the time. But I just think another thing is a lot of orphanages, if we look at who runs them and who funds them, they don't tend to be practitioners. They big hearted people, churches, must be social workers or development practitioners, by and large. I'm not sort of saying everyone, but by and large, it's sort of a humanitarian response. And therefore, a lot of the time it's not run even in line with Tanzanian law. And I will mention Tanzanian law is fantastic in the sense that it protects children and it, it, the law is very clear. Children should not go into orphanages unless it's the last resort, unless um, they have tried foster care first. So the law is written in a way that absolutely supports what I'm saying. The problem has always been implementation and practice and that uh, by and large is because the Tanzanian orphanage care system is predominantly a privately run system. It's not necessarily government run. And so when we did our research, we found, for example, all the orphanages in Tanga, there's a law that says you have to have a social worker on staff. Not a single orphanage had a social worker on staff. 
Well, without a social worker on staff, you can't ensure that there's anyone actually implementing the law properly. The law also states that you cannot recruit children, you can only get children referred through three mechanisms um, of the law. And that what we ended up finding was that 78% of children were not referred legally into the system. So they were referred through other means. So there's a big problem and it's not, I'll give you another thing, is orphanages can raise money. Um, and especially maybe a little, I mean, Indar a little bit, but Arusha Moshi, they've become tourist attractions. And it's not, doesn't make up the whole landscape in Tanzania, but it makes a big percentage of it. I, I sort of, you have to categorize it down a little bit. There's people doing it for different reasons. But you can't ignore that. And the UK, US, the UN have all recognized actually that orphanage trafficking is a new form of modern day slavery. And what it means is that children are being placed in orphanages purely for the tourism dollar that they bring in. So they're being actually just recruited. Say, hey, you know, bring us the kids and we can raise some tourism dollar. And Tanzania is not exempt from being actually one of the hotspots of that happening around the world. Cambodia, Kenya, Tanzania, Nepal, Thailand. These are all countries where orphanage trafficking is very high, particularly in tourism hotspots. You'll find, for example, in Arusha, they have more baby homes than the rest of the country combined. It's not because they have more orphan babies. It's predominantly because they are in the line of the tourist trail. And it has become part of the landscape that you go on safari and you go and visit an orphanage. And that is challenging because it disincentivizes orphanages to become empty. And that should always be the goal, is that these babies should be finding a home. And actually the incentivization is, you know, the younger, the cuter, the more volunteers and donors that are going to come. And so orphanage trafficking is a big reason that, you know, a lot of orphanages don't want to change or will refuse to change because of that. And so there's a hope, I mean, it's a complicated question, but there's a number of reasons depending kind of on why they were started in the first place. So anything from a little bit more sinister into this didn't know better into we want to change but we don't know how. And so I think there's, and there are more programs like this in Tanzania, but they tend to be smaller because they're harder to fund. They are absolutely harder to fund. Um, and that is a big part of it. And I know a lot of practitioners doing this kind of work that cannot find the funding to do it or have to kind of work it. <laughs> Thank you, Georgina. Does anyone else have any questions um, for Georgina or comments even? Anybody? I just wanna say thank you. You're doing a great job and I think you've enlightened all of us, if not all of us, at least me, um, about the scenario that's happening in Tanzania or even worldwide and the differences mm -hmm. about an orphanage and actually foster care. Um, and I hope we can support something of this sort soon. We are a brand new Rotary Club, so we're still a baby club. So we, try, we try to help as much as we can, but I think this has opened our eyes that we there is better options we have as opposed to orphanages, I guess. But yeah, anyone else, any comments? So Georgina, sorry, have you heard of Railway Africa? Uh, you know, I think we, yes. myself, and, myself and Lena, we met up with them some, some sure. months ago, uh, because I think they are into similar kind of a thing, right? Uh, they, yeah. They're actually uh, look, getting street children off the streets and then uh, counseling yeah. them and stuff, yeah? Yeah, railway, railway children, actually, there was supposed to have a conference just before the schools were all shut down and Pomodile was going to be one of their speakers on working with children under the age of five. So railway children do a lot of work with street children and getting children back into families and they actually just changed a little bit and they're supporting orphanages now who want to flip their model. And so they've just gone into that for orphanages that are looking to get teenagers particularly back into families and who lack the skill around reunification and family-based care, they've actually started a project, I think it was last year, um, working on that with a few orphanages. I think one of them was in Dar, I believe. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. I spoke to them at the beginning of the project. So yeah, they, they do similar work, but more focusing on teenagers and, and that sort of later age, whereas we're more focusing on children under the age of five. But yeah, they do some fantastic work as well. Right. Have you had any instances where um, a child is abused in foster care also? Not to date, no, not to date. I mean, it's a relatively new project. Um, and that is obviously something that you, you 
you have to always be aware of. So families are, there's, and there's quite a strict process that is gone, goes through. So families have to be recommended by them when you're Kiti, their religious leader, they have to have all these referrals to them. Uh, they then are home assessed. Did I get off? So they're then home assessed and they're visited regularly. Now, I think a lot of the stigma around foster care comes from a European model and an American, American model. And I, I think it is important to consider that it is very different in every kind of cultural context. Um, and just statistically, children are far more likely to be abused in an orphanage than they are in a foster family. So abuse is, I mean, child abuse is just rampant in any kind of setting. So no setting is ever going to be foolproof or able to kind of completely um, stop that. But I just, statistically, it's less likely in a foster care setting than an orphanage. And the vetting process is, is, has been done quite well, especially the one that I've been part of here in Tanga, um, to kind of monitor families, keep an eye on them. Some things that can be done as well is to only put sort of young teenage girls in with single women. Um, has been some of the other mechanisms that can be put in place to kind of reduce uh, chances of any anything like that. Um, and yeah, the, it's just the regular checkup, which the foster child has a connection to a social worker. And that's one of the big things that is po positive about that is when children are in orphanages, they don't have enough community contact. And community contact is what really um, allows us to spot abuse, is the more people that are putting eyes on a child, the more likely you are to catch the signs of abuse. Whereas the less that that happens, which particularly yeah. in orphanages is one of the issues, the more likely abuse is to actually occur to children. Thank you. Yeah. Any, anyone else? Do we have anything to say? Just thank you. Oh, thank you, Farhan. That was great. <laughs> it's good to find out about, uh, you know, I know some of these programs where you come as tourists and you have to pay $2,000 to work just to help out volunteer at a foster home. And I always thought something was wrong with that. So it's good to yeah. kind of find out what they're up to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the, the, the number one thing is I hope to always get across to people is family is universally desired. There's not been a culture or society in the world that has ever moved away from family. You know, we've all got our different interpretations of what family means, but every culture throughout history has, has organized around a family. And so those children who've lost their family still have that right to that. But more importantly, is that most children that are being separated from their family have one. And so the key is we should be supporting the whole family unit. What is the root cause of this problem? And so if you're ever looking at doing things with orphan and vulnerable children, whether through from Wadaleo or anywhere that you look to do it, I always just hope that it sticks with you that ask what's the root of this problem and how do we solve that so that it's child-centered at the heart of it. Because children do, don't exist in isolation and they should always be considered as a unit. So how do we make sure this unit functions better? And things like free daycare, free formula milk, feeding programs, um, business, business um, trainings for kinship carers or single mums even, or families living with different health conditions. You know, It can be the difference between a family feeling like they have no options and they do have options to step up and step in for that family. So yeah, I hope that sort of sits with you guys. <laughs> And Karibu Tanga. <laughs> cool. So yeah, thank you for giving us knowledge about what you do. And yeah, it was great having you. Thank you so much. And thank you. I hope everyone stays safe during this and is okay. sane through yeah. what we're going through. Um, anything else anybody wants to add at all? No? No, just, um, yeah, thank you so much. I, th I always, um, I, I love being able to, to just kind of have like your, your assumptions or, you know, what, what you originally thought, um, kind of like inverted or changed because I think so many of my, even my friends, um, who, who are in the U S like 
probably like let's rewind three years or four years ago um there there is like you said this this desire to help orphanages and it's not coming from anything malevolent um people think that that's the best way to to support something so the more you know um and it's i guess it's just great and inspiring to know that people are taking more data-driven approaches that there is an evidence base behind this and that change while it's small as you mentioned the, those family preservation programs that are a lot more complex don't necessarily have the same the same uh grandeur or support behind them right now that it is it is moving forward and it is happening i know rwanda like they were doing their um like a big campaign to get rid of orphanages and i hope tanzania will be following so i think it's really exciting that you're leading this this program actually, especially if you just look at the country surrounding and see the trend, the global trend that's that's occurring yeah. right now. For sure. Yeah, I hope so. I hope Tanzania starts to kind of pick up on the on the changes that are really needed because you know it's a big problem here. It's a really big problem here. There's a lot of small children being raised in orphanages that don't need to be there. And there's so many better ways that we could help them, you know reduce their trauma and become educated, successful, healthy members of society, which I guess is the goal of all of these kind of support projects, isn't it? And so um, I just think we can do so much better when it comes to that demographic of children, for sure. Amazing. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And if you guys have any suggestions for any more speakers in the next, well, in two weeks time, you can just shoot me a message and yeah, I hope everyone stays safe and thank you so much, Georgina. Thank you, Manka. <laughs> okay. Nice to so see everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.